we're going to get our hands dirty with some code. And that code is going to help us learn about variables, types, objects, mutability, and states. So variables and all of its fine little fellow friends there. So we're going to start by looking at examples of how you make a variable, what works, what doesn't, valid names, how you reference them, etc. Then we're going to go talk about types. If you remember from our last video, this is the groupings of variables that we have and the special characteristics that are shared. We're going to talk about casting, which is switching in between the two, and then some of the methods and attributes that are attached to different types and how we access them and find them. Then we're going to talk about objects. If you remember from our last video, we said that everything in Python is an object. So in one sense, this section is going to be about looking at everything that Python can do. And then we're going to talk about the concept, the more broad concept of mutability, sort of an evolution over time. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about state, one of those snapshots inside the timeline of mutability, as I like to say. So if you are ready for an amazing lesson, let's begin. All right, let's talk how to create a new and empty variable. So is this enough information to make a variable? We've got my underscore personality, because it kind of looks like it is. Will this create a blink variable that we can use later? Let's try. No, all right, so let's inspect this error. Name error colon, name my personality is not defined. So the way I interpret this is that we have something that looks like a variable, but instead of saying make it out of thin air, because we don't have it already, we're sort of saying, hey, bring me this and show me what's inside of it. And it's saying, I don't know where this is. I've never seen it. It's not defined before. So what if we add an assignment operator, our equal sign, and a string called cautiously optimistic to it? Now do you think we're going to get a new variable called my personality? Well, we might have. It definitely didn't give us an error, which is a good sign, but we're going to need to do more than that. So why don't we wrap it inside this ID function, and we're going to say, is there a name and binding that we can find? And there is, right? A unique identifier like we talked about in the last video. This is a way that we do know we have a variable now that can go through different states. It can mutate over time. And if we want to see the current state that it's in now, we can simply print it out, cautiously optimistic. So, but what about if we don't have anything in the string? Like we're saying, yeah, put a string inside of it, but there's nothing in it, in the string. Is this going to give us a blank variable? Well, we didn't get an error, so maybe. We did get an ID, and the ID is definitely different. 448 there, 248 here. So let's print out and see what's inside of it. Might not print anything because it's empty, but it is a new variable. So. All right, now we have the understanding of how we can create a blank variable. Let's talk about what kind of valid names we can use for them, because there is some stipulations here that we need to follow. So how about this? Is a capital OK? We have all lowercase, we have underscore, but we've got this one capital X. Is that going to become a list? Yep, not a problem. No errors came up. And we could prove that with the ID, but just take my word for it. What about this? Is a dash OK? Student dash grade equals 10. Let's find out. Ooh, error. And a syntax error, so we know that that's the problem. Can't assign to the operator. It's because we have this here. However, if we make it an underscore, it's an easy fix. Now we do have a variable. What about if it starts with a number? OK, we talked about numbers before. If you remember, you're going to know the answer to this. And that is failed syntax again. So if we're going to make a variable, we can't use a number. But we could do something like this, one underscore grade. OK, and this is the more normal naming conventions, is using lowercase and underscores. You can use camel case. It's not going to throw an error, but it's not really the best guideline to follow. So we have different variables, and they come in groupings. Let's look at a variable here. We'll assign my personality to cautiously optimistic. And then we are going to use this function, type. And we're going to wrap it around our variable, and we're going to see what it returns. String. OK, so this is our way to find out what type something is. Now, behind the scenes, Python knew this was a string. So it put it in here, and now this can read it out. And if you were to put an integer or a float, it would sort of be doing that same thing in the background. But there's also a concept in programming called casting. And in this case, we're explicitly saying to Python, hey, even though this number is coming in, in quotes, meaning it's a string, I need you to convert it into an integer and store it in such a way. And there's different reasons why we would want it stored different ways. They take up different amounts of memory. So what do you think is going to happen when we run this? 
we are getting a response saying that it did not register it as a string, but instead as an integer, which is exactly what we wanted. The function worked properly. And this is the concept of casting. And at different times, we're going to want our variables to be holding different types of variables because we can do different things with them. Like float, we can do mathematics in a more precise way. With strings, we can do special loops that help us pull characters out. And it all kind of depends on what your code is. But you have to keep your mind around the flow as you scroll down a long you know, program that you've written, where your variables are, what types they are, and actually naming them, like float, integer, uh, it's really not a bad idea. In certain times, that can help you keep an identity on where things are. But going back to just this basic casting, here's another example. We have a string coming in. We want to make it a float. We can use the float method to make that happen. And over here, we actually have a string, and we are bringing in a float. So we have a number here, and we're saying, can you turn this into a string, some characters, some text? And of course, we can do the very same thing. And we have this type function that we can always use to check. You'll use type all the time. It comes in really handy when you're expecting something to happen and it doesn't. Go in and check the type. Say, you know, does it have the characteristics that I think it does? Now, another topic that's sort of related and ultra important that we're going to talk about throughout the entire series is the concept of methods and attributes. And we're just going to touch on it here. But when you have a type, a variable that falls under a type that tells you a lot about what functionality it has. So let's just make this toy variable, meaning just one to play with. And let's print it out so we know that we have this string called happy as a clam. Now, by adding this dot syntax, we're adding a method, OK? And because it's a string type, we have dot upper. Now, you can't do this with float. It's specific to the string. But since we know it's a string, we can actually use dot upper. So what do you think this method's going to do? Ah, nothing. You were wrong. Actually, because we forgot to put on these parentheses, we just asked what it is. We didn't really say run it. But by ad adding these parentheses, we're calling what's essentially a function. But it's you know we're going to learn more about this. It's like an attached function. It's called a method. But by adding the parentheses, we actually get it to change the text until it's now in all capitals. So that's the same variable, but it's actually taking what's inside of it. It knows it's a string, and it does this conversion for us. And this becomes really powerful as we start linking a bunch of different types of methods together. So what do you think this is going to do, dir? Something we haven't seen before. Let's wrap it around our variable and find out. Whoa, what is all this stuff? So this long list of methods and attributes that we can use. We're going to learn more about these. They're private. So you don't really use them as often, but sometimes you need them. But you know, capitalize, like we had before, um, encode, count, count how many letters there are, join it together with something else, split. There's all sorts of cool stuff we can do. And all we have to do is wrap it in this dir, and it'll print out everything. So we don't always have to go to the documentation. But you know, maybe something we don't really understand, like translate, like what is it translated into? This is the kind of thing that we might want to Google. Cut and paste this, type Python, go to Google, and find it in the documentation. So this is a great way to just play around with things and learn a ton about fun stuff you can do. And it gives you a lot of ideas when you're building programs. Now let me, let me show you something that's kind of cool. This is another Jupyter-specific thing. But the same way we had the dir that showed us this long list, one really useful thing is called a dot tab. So if you write a variable, my personality, we know it's of type string, we can actually do a period, and then I'm hitting tab. Okay, When I hit tab, it gives me a list of all of those same functions that you saw above, except now we can just simply go in and put them into our code as so. And we know that we're spelling them right. We know we have the syntax correct. And it's a super useful thing that you're going to use all the time if you're programming in a Jupyter Notebook. And there's also one more thing you might want to know is similar to dir, we have another function called help. OK, so most important is what's down here at the bottom. It's going to return a copy of the string, but it's going to be converted to uppercase. What's an object in Python? It's answer everything, right? So we talk about this like as a super duper base class. It's the kind of thing that has certain properties. Everything in Python you can touch is going to share a function, a variable, an etc., cetera, and et cetera. So is this type of variable an object, a list? Yes, it is, because it's a thing you can do. What about this, a string? 
Oh yeah, you better believe an integer is. What about a float? Yep, object, object. What about none? Object, true, object, everything's an object. And it just means that there's some basic properties that it has, which is great because it gives us some base understanding of what we can do with anything we touch. Um, and it's you know unique. It, not all programming languages have something like a super duper base class, but Python does, and it becomes really convenient down the road. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about that naming importance I touched on before. So if you make a variable name, you can make it whatever you want. But if you make it misleading, it can cause problems down the road. So for example, imagine if I make this variable. It's called example underscore list underscore forward. So we know it's an example list. And forward, it would be interpreted by the human as, OK, in order, one, two, three, four, right? So when we run this, we get one, two, three, four. But we can also name this originally something that makes sense. And then over time, through the process of mutability, it can find itself in a state where it's not forward anymore. Four, three, two, one, and definitely Python isn't going to know to raise an error or an exception or anything that can help us understand that later. So, you know, keeping these names right in the way that you want to read your code and you want other people to be able to read it is something that you should think about. When you're done with the program, maybe go back and rename things. There's usually features like find and replace. You might think something makes sense at first and then over time realize it's not. So it's important to make sure that these are the kind of things that stay consistent throughout the process, the process of mutability, the evolution of a variable. Um, and now let's talk about ID reuse. So let me close a couple of these up. Oops, too many. Um, let's talk about ID reuse. Now, we talked about every variable having a unique place in memory. Python's trying to be efficient. It's trying to not waste computing power. And one way it does that is by reusing things that are exactly the same on its back end. So look at A being assigned to 2. When we run an ID, we're going to get a unique identifier. It's the only one like this in the computer, OK? And for reference, it ends with 560. But if we make another variable, and it's also assigned to the integer 2, its ID, oh my gosh, it's the same. 429-7148560. Oh. How could that be? That's both variable A and variable B. And didn't, Dylan, you say to me before that everything, every variable has a unique ID? You did. And Dylan, it's time to face up to it. You were wrong. Or you're a liar. But here's what's happening when you have two of the exact same values. It's going to save memory. Because it knows that there's no difference, and it remembers where the variables are separated. So these are just pointers pointing to the same thing. However, in fact, I'm going to put this in right here. If it's a 2.0, like a float, you're going to see it's going to give us an entirely different ID, because this is going to take up more memory than an integer. So it needs a new spot. And if we do go back to integers, but we use the number 3, of course, we have a different number also. So as long as it's the exact same type and the exact same value, it will reuse the same memory on the back end. Earth, 4.6 billion years old. We're going to make a variable, and we're going to assign it the float. But here's where I want you to follow the variable of life. We're going to assign it to Earth. So when we actually execute the cell, we get the 4.6. It's transferred into one variable, through the variable, into a new one. Then we're going to reassign life to a string, primordial soup, then back to a float, 3.7 then back to a string fish, then back to an integer, not a float anymore, of 530 million years, and then back to a string for Homo sapien, and then back to an integer for 200,000 years. Now, I've got a question for you. What state is life in right now? The last one that we saw, because we're asking for a snapshot as of right now. And this could have also been a state. If at this point, if you said, hey, you know, show me the state from cell number three here, that would be 4.6. And it would be an entirely different type. So the variable went through this huge evolution, right? 
it was a float, it was another variable, it was a string, it was an integer, and finally we came to the state of life. Now, that's really the end of this variable section, but I want to show you one cool little thing. So there is a special thing you can do with Python 3.5 where you can swap two numbers with one line of code. And you might see it, and I don't want it to trip you up, but say we have this variable a, which has been assigned to the integer 7. We have b, which is assigned to the integer 5. We can actually just write b, comma a. So they're in a list here, kind of like a mini list. And then we can assign it to a comma b. And what it's going to do is just flip the two around, which otherwise would have taken two extra variables to switch into. So you can see that we can print out a being 5, even though b was originally assigned to 5. So that is it for this lesson. And thank you guys for learning about variables with me. We'll see you in the next lesson. Subscribe to the New Monic Academy YouTube channel for daily uploads that will help you learn amazing concepts through effortless associations.